these data, and I'm uh, doing some work on using images to represent a variety of things, uh, especially in the context that uh, almost everything we do is now being exposed to the public in ways that it never has been before. And academics and researchers are having to look further and further afield to original and innovative sources for funding and so on. So the audience we speak to has changed substantially. Uh, and I've been looking at ways of using images to communicate meaning. So rather than communicating directly things like a lot of numbers, which we will look at shortly, most of this is about presenting the meaning of those numbers, or the meaning of a particular research project, rather than what the empirical fact. <coughs> the trend, in, as you've seen throughout today, this afternoon, the trend towards visual representation is taking off, and that's why this project is so well funded so quickly. Um, there's a lot of research now going on. Interestingly enough, not in academia. It's not mostly academics that are researching this, it's designers. Uh, and they're the ones with all the fresh ideas about how to present stuff. And this really is about how images communicate concepts. So in this one, what's being communicated is that this may look very, very beautiful, but you don't have to look very far to find the epic scale of ocean born pollution but it's concealed from us by a variety of things like propaganda and illusion and news, or bias news and so on. There's three techniques I'm going to look at uh, today, starting with something that builds on, neither quite nicely, on uh, our last presentation, if only to show that taking it further than that, some people can do it, um, but it's quite difficult, and that's about big data. I'm going to look at some infographic stuff as well, particularly the site. I'm going to ask you to go on it and have a look at, have a look at that. Tell me how you feel about it, because I've had quite mixed feelings about it. It, was, it seems to me to be fairly superficial, and we could probably do something better with using a pen and pencil, you know, or PowerPoint, or something, something like that. Uh, and I'm going to look at images as transformative, like the initial images that you saw. Uh, because they're really useful, it seems, in communicating to lay people the substance of what you're talking about. Lay people may, may or may not understand the in-depth detail, the boring down that we tend to do in our research. But if you can communicate meaning through images, then you're halfway to helping them to understand what it is. So if we start with this guy, Hans Rosley, who's quite famous. <coughs> He's talking, about, he's talking about showing myths about the developing world in statistics. And he goes beyond screen use like this into something which is quite... Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we stop the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go, can you see that? It's China, they're moving against better health, they're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they, no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a Miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and then move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Professor Rosling is quite famous for this kind of thing. It's a very kind of, it's a very public thing, and increasingly we're being asked to engage with the public, and we're increasingly being asked to do it with innovation and all these other buzzwords that we're falling foul of. Sorry, embracing wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, there is an even more spectacular one that Professor Rosling does, where he's not actually close to the screen doing this thing like this over it, he's speaking like a racehorse commentator. And what he's doing is standing where I am, and he does this. And up will come a big three-dimensional display that appears like it's hanging in the middle of the air. There's a little technician you know, following signals like that, or whatever signals he uses. And he'll do that, and three bars will raise, and he'll do that, and part. 
and it's like being on the deck of the Starship Enterprise in the latest movies. It's a staggering display. I ruled it out. Personally, because it's so expensive, so time consuming, and so rare. And I think that for cost effectiveness, presentation, getting ideas across my colleagues, um, my colleagues know this work as well, and in fact are more accessible. You have more chance of creating something like you demonstrated than you have of doing things that Hans, Hans Gosling does. But maybe we can think of those as the gold standard. And that takes us to this kind of stuff. We're being engaged in Hans Gosling stuff. We were being engaged in the moving elements of the presentations that we've seen before. And part of the trick is about keeping, retaining that engagement. In the same way that when we're working with students, what the big agenda now is uh, engagement and retention and engagement. This is the same stuff we're talking about. These are the tools to generate that. So to reinforce this idea, we're being asked in many ways to be populist and popular. We're not talking about sellout tours that would uh, you know, credit some rock band. We're talking about having to make our material understandable to a wider audience. And the essence of this is coming in two further forms that I'll look at. One of them is infographics, and one of them is just images. Um, so Hans's thing is time expensive and complex and out of reach. It's not really doable for most, most people. But when we come to infographics, here's a definition. Now we've touched on them uh, a couple of times before this afternoon. But to define them, it's a type of picture that blends data and design. So those are two key concepts that we're trying to uh, integrate. And what that is for is to project a combination of elements to an audience. The elements are that's your research. The design is what connects the research to their brain via their eyes. That's really all the message uh, is about. Now these infographics are very common in print media. They won't you know, they're a fairly, fairly recent thing. 2002 is when they started really kicking off. But they're one of the most common way, most popular ways to present a great deal of data visually in a small space. And they're accessible because the way that design works is to connect a number to another way of interpreting. So instead of counting stuff, you're seeing the size and scale of stuff. Uh, a few examples, this would be a quite a primitive one, <coughs> excuse me, quite a primitive one. I've taken all these direct from a, a, an unfiltered Google search uh, for infographics. So very, very simple, very easy to do. You can do that in PowerPoint in 45 minutes flat. Uh, grabbing the icons, the icons you'll be able to get from uh, comments for a credit comments, free websites and just drop them into place on a, on a regular background. More complex, this is involved cut out players, which normally means some experience with Photoshop if you want to do a decent job of it. The rest of it can all be done again in PowerPoint. I sound like I'm a salesman for PowerPoint, I don't mean to be at all, but I'm thinking about whether you use an interactive website that I'm going to take you to of that kind, or whether you think that using PowerPoint is probably easier or not so. Yet more complex. You would need uh, quite a lot of time to do something like that, and quite a lot of design experience and experience with something like Photoshop. Back to something slightly, uh, slightly clearer. It's a combination of things, but the essence, the importance of this one is that it is a, you can send it easily, you can tweet it easily, you can get it onto social media easily. Now, I don't use social media so much. Now, lots of other people do, and maybe that will work better for them. So I don't know how to integrate it into tweet, twi Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, apparently it can be done. Okay. Uh, the principles from about this, about infographics, they haven't appeared randomly. And they have been drawn from design and graphics. So what infographics are doing are projecting to you, using long-established rules, some of which the first presenter uh, talked about. And there are some basic tips that he referred to, like uh, for example, white space and consistency of font and simplicity and stuff like that. The colour palettes and blah, 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 blah. 
So what you've got then is a combination of two processes. Projection through design and the content of your research data. Those two things integrated are what appear in infographics. Once upon a time, as a domain of expert, the infographics could only be done by you know, specialists who have been working in Photoshop or whatever for uh, years and years and years. But now, uh, you can get to websites. And one of the key principles of uh, this one I'm going to take you to, and maybe you can spend a moment having a look at it on your laptop, so please, if you can go to visme.co, then you'll be able to do this uh, instead of just watching something that I've done. <coughs> okay, so here's one I made earlier. Now, ooh, the way Bisbee works is that you get, uh, you now once you sign in, it's free to sign in. They give you background templates. So what you what you see there is an existing template that's free. This drag and drop is exactly the same principle as some of the uh, website builders that you'll have used yourself. You, know, you may have heard of Wix.com, one of the biggest for doing yourself websites that uses no coding. So all you're doing is dragging and dropping items from menus onto a screen. Sorry, onto a, onto a band band like this. So all of this, this is a preset one. What it will do is allow you to do some quite nice tasty little design work. So for example, if I were to double click on this, up here you can set which ones you want to like which ones you want to show. What the pop this is one of my criticisms of it. I clicked and moved and now this is what's happened. So if we go back back there and set population to 100, then you now have a new um, cast of characters size 100 and you can manipulate the size of this and its location wherever you like to. And the same with this. And the proportions that our designer this morning was saying you have to use Adobe Illustrator and have some skill in, skill in that and so on. This site allows you to adjust this really easily. So here, when I change the value, and again, um, I change the value to 50, watch how the red and black proportions change. So those are really, really pretty easy. It's slightly annoying to, uh, to do. Uh, very, very quick indeed. And if you want to, if you only want to use one element or one aspect of this, you can use Microsoft uh, Windows, what do you call it, the screen grab, screen snatch, screen copy. What is it? No, not print screen, screen grab. Yeah, so you get a cursor when you print the screen, when you click on screen grab, you get a cursor like a, a gun sight, and you just drag it and you can copy that, or copy elements that you wanted and paste it into a Word document or a website or, oh, PowerPoint. And we keep going back to that, one, and we will for good reason. So there's your opportunities to do lots of visual changing. And probably the most useful element of this site, or it's for me personally, is the ability quickly and easily to change these numbers so long as you don't accidentally uh, drive too far. So change that to 35. It does it immediately, there's no messing about. You can then publish uh, and you can upgrade if you want to, uh, if, you, if you want a really nice uh, template. The downside the templates, yes, they're free, but I noticed that. From the point of signing into it, where it's like you're attracted to by saying free templates, there are actually only four or five that are free. And then, so you might save one, and when you go back to it, it's the only one that's free. And it means that if you want to use any other template, then you have to pay their subscription rate. I think, and this is a very personal, sort of subjective opinion, I think it's manipulative. Uh, I think they, they drag you into it. I know this is marketing, I know, I know. But, you know, other places, like Wix, for example, when I, I build a website there, they'll give me a landing free templates for as long as I want, forever. You know. So compared to this, I think this one feels a bit nasty. Um, and 
Simple, mostly. Quirky, definitely. It wobbles, it falls over in my experience. I'm not in adept at using websites, website building, drag and drop. This one, which to me, feels quite quirky. Try it on your own. Um, what did you think about it? Has anyone logged into it and had a fiddle? No? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? What did you think about it? Who said that? What did you I, I mean, you could make something pretty quickly with yeah. this uh, without too much problems or experience, but um, just from um, a, a first look, it doesn't look like you've got a great deal of control if you want it to tweak very minor details. But uh, I, I think yeah, that, I, that, just, was, no, no, that was the conclusion I drew as well. There are limits to it. If you, I think it's very good if you want to quickly present some basic data especially to a lay audience. Getting into more detail for a more advanced audience, I think, would require something different. This is one, uh, this is an infographic, a primitive one that I made um, on the back of a cigarette packet, as it were, to hold this thing. So in my area is the peace building and human security, I wanted to present some I wanted to demonstrate the concept that most people's security in the world is not measured in the terms by which we define security, which is normally done to the bond tanks, people in the south and so on. So what I did was this, this is figures from 2011. In conventional warfare, where we tend to associate most security issues, 42,007 uh, soldiers and civilians died. So that's avoidable death, but then I found the scale is quite dramatically different. So from large to large, I don't worry about the figures. What I'm demonstrating is how I created an infographic, a mobile infographic from almost nothing, using figures that came from a, a reliable academic source. And then ultimately, so from war, 450, one person, for every one person that dies from war, 452 die from infectious diseases, malaria, and so on. Now, if we wanted to give a to a British, you know, as a, a minister or someone in the civil service or something, the scale of difference between what we normally think about security and how people actually die, then that might be an infographic that would do it. It's quite a basic one. Did you do that in, on the website, or did you then take the images out and then put them into, like, Prezi, or is that all done on one? This is all PowerPoint. It's all oh, so you're using PowerPoint? Yep. Yeah. But you make these images in PowerPoint? I import the images. The images of the bullets, for example, were imported initially, so it was just in ZERS, file in ZERS. Oh, okay. You just drop the picture in onto the slide. And the pictures are from the website you just shared? No, the pictures are from various places around the internet. Okay. Some of which I took, some of which, you know, Marty does go. You get the pictures from anywhere and put the insert them into a PowerPoint file. And then you can move them around just as you can with text or anything else. Yeah, okay. The moving bits are you we use motion tweens, they're hidden away in the in the software, but they're very, very simple indeed to use, the animation, the tweens and all that stuff. It's really to do that as opposed to a static display is two or three clicks difference for each for each item. That's really all it is. And that brings me to death by PowerPoint. This thing, you know how we face PowerPoint on a sort of daily basis, and our students do as well. And there's this term now called death by PowerPoint, or DDP for short, for the informed. Um, and I really, I, this is really what started me off on this road, that I was so fed up with my own presentations, and I thought I had to do something about it. And I thought, it's probably just me, and then at conferences and all the rest of it, I thought, oh God, I really want to hang myself when I see. A slide just full of words and 85 bullet points, and you know, someone's an original contribution to presenting the PowerPoint is to change the background so it's red instead of green, or it's got some flowers on it, or a wasp, or you know, a falling bomb, or any of this stuff that really wasted amazing opportunities to communicate with images. So, this element is the transformation element, and it's more, more really what I specialize in, but in graphics, is about transformation in, in many ways. There's a very simple method behind all of this, and that's the picture paints a thousand words, and we seem to have forgotten this 
when we're using uh, commu information communication, visual communications. This, whenever I, so I work in Peterville, and whenever I want to talk about the process of trust, I would use an image like that. Because ethically, what is happening at the moment is that I am feeding your ears with words, and I am feeding your eyes with images. And the, that's the way around it's supposed to work. So in, what I could have been doing is feeding your ears with words, and then feeding your eyes with the same words. And that overloads our cognate load. So cognitive mode theory, theory says duplicate words and speech is a waste of time. In fact, it's damaging. <coughs> so images help at presenting at conferences, but any kind of public audience will be engaged differently with images, as opposed to putting up text, qualitative information, quotes, and so on. There's a different process uh, involved, which aids memory and recall as well. So if you're teaching the students, then it also works there. But it's also an astonishing ability for a very simple image with a very small intervention to act well to communicate the entire meaning of a whole website. So this is the Red Cross website. The picture, the overall picture is non-posed. It was taken somewhere. Uh, and the addition of the cross in the middle, that's all they have to do, and it communicates the entire concept. Everything about the Red Cross, the connectivity between uh, two groups of humans, the provider and the, the rescuer and the, and the saviour, so the terrain, the complexity, the vulnerability, you can't see it because I quite badly placed that little log in the river that he's standing on. Uh, in one image, with one small intervention, Red Cross's website uh, was considered to be a, well, in visual terms, it's considered to be a, a minor masterpiece. Uh, so it helps more specialists comprehend. We get in pictures, we can understand in pictures what we may not immediately get in words. We can understand, or rather non-specialists can grasp what's going on in that relationship between the monk and the tiger without me having to talk about what was going on with the monk and the tiger. Because it doesn't take very long to realise that the monk must have trusted the tiger and the tiger must have trusted the monk to get that close to each other and for one to share its food with the other. Now the person behind this, the academic behind most of the research uh, is Richard Mayer at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he did this big fat book uh, about multimedia, uh, research for multimedia. And it's probably the kind, the kind, it's the Bible, if you like, of multimedia research, modern, modern 2010 uh, research. But there's a bunch of other people as well. I can point to those if anyone's interested later. But he is like one side of it. Because outside of it, academia, business, marketing, design, they got tricky with this years ago. And they have been doing presentations on Wall Street and all the other places where a lot of money is made, that rely on pictures. That don't baffle with bullet points, that don't bore with bullet points, that are recognised as innovative, that people actually want to attend. So when they hear that someone like Steve Jobs, for his soul, is doing a presentation, they think, ah, it's different, it uses images, it'll talk us through the images, la da 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 in a not dissimilar way to what we're doing uh, now. It's a simple message again. Picture paints a thousand words. But academically, intellectually, pedagogically speaking, what's happening is dual processing. Words for the ears, pictures for the eyes, instead of words, words. It's not a massive change, but it's a conceptual change in how we communicate, present information, and the extent to which it's recalled. It doesn't matter what the topic is. It could be maths. I was, I was delighted to hear this morning that quote from 1805. Something to do with it, it's not numbers, it's a line. Can you tell me what that was again? Oh, beautiful. I love the simplicity of the complexity. It's just staggering. That one took me just like that. It made that connection. And that's the next, where, the next place I'll go when I think about how to present numbers visually. But, any subject then into the ear can be augmented 
with a parallel image. Same message, same differently. That's all. That's all it's saying. The beauty of this is in its simplicity once you get through the pedagogic language. So here's a few examples I'd like to share with you. And they're all, I think, I think they're all qualitative. So they may not seem immediately re relevant if you're only dealing with numbers or something that's not non qualitative. But it might actually stick. Because even when you're talking about numbers, you're talking about the meaning of numbers, aren't you? As well as the numbers themselves. This image is something I would use to talk about structural violence. It shows the agency involved, the responsibility involved, the action involved in government choices about bombs or maternity wards. The choice is between a bomb or a pill. Simply cutting off, that act of cutting off shows agency. It says that it's not just an act of fate, whether we get hospitals or bombs. It says that men, and it's mainly men, make choices about who gets what. And that's what an image like that can be used for saying. You can be talking about any kind of specific policy. You can be giving the numbers of uh, investment numbers for uh, healthcare in the UK or Nepal or wherever. You could be talking about ratio of money spent on them by the Ministry of Defence versus the NHS. But that image will convey a set of relationships, and it will convey what is being said, the visual, and the two will link up together. But as, as much someone else was saying before, the images and st storytelling, I think you referred to mm -hmm. earlier on. So I thought I'd try just this little, little thing here. Do you recognise this? It's Tintin and Snowy. My dog's called Snowy as well. She's nothing like that. But this is how we understand Tintin. This is how Tintin is projected. Classic, beautiful story of a boy's adventures with his dog against the evils of the world, blah, 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 Hollywood. And this is how he's re represented in Cambodia, which, until very well, is still heavily mind-affected. And this image is photographed from the front cover of a school child's notebook. So you remember when you were at school, you would have a notebook and you'd cover it in a picture at the front and you'd take notes and you'd write down stuff in it. This is one that was supplied by an aid organisation and the Cambodian government and some mine clearing organisations that helped fund it. Now what the image does is communicate something in ways that are apposite for a particular age group. And the same method can be taken wider to appeal to a particular audience of a particular intellectual level or experience that's apposite in terms of the research you're doing and what, who you're trying to sell it to or communicate it to or explain it to. So the method is in finding the medium, the visual medium that's apposite to the people you're speaking to. And that may be half-term report for PhD or it may be uh, a viva voce, which will be in the future will be part of the visual, I, I imagine. Or it may be presenting to the uh, Leverhulme Trust or whoever, whoever it is that you want to get money from. Uh, telling a story about what your research is doing. Because to lay people, there is not few things better than being able to understand the story of the research rather than the facts about it. Okay, so. And then here is where we slip into digital art which is the revolution since the late 1990s. And this is a 1998. Uh, it's actually pre-Photoshop, so Sachi and Sachi, who made this, uh, did very, very well in technical terms. And what it's able to convey is that domestic violence, at its most profound, is not expressed through the standard, we believe, fist. It's done through verbal control. That you're stupid. You, you're a terrible cook. You don't raise the children properly. You don't bring in any money. Your skirt's too long. Your skirt's too short. Your trousers are too baggy. Whatever it is. So that image is able to convey a conceptual breach of the literature, which once upon a time said it was all about the face, but now understands that that was only the tip of the iceberg. The message really is that letting images speak. So this one took me about five minutes in Photoshop. It was just two, just two layers and uh, using the rubber to get rid of the, of the human around the eyes. It's quite absolutely simple. 
And it was well worth it, please, apart from spending 800 quid on the software for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're different universities, okay. I forgot myself for a moment. So that, that image from me, I use it to talk about um, evolution. The extent to which we're still connected to an evolutionary past that's rooted in um, a form. And how far or how different are we, goes the question. And the second kind of really, first of all, let the images be, don't overwhelm the text. Because that's what it, well, that's how I feel. When I saw that picture, I knew that was what I was looking for, because that's how I feel every time I go to a conference and I see a PowerPoint slide come up with eight bullets that I am in text, and I want to just go bang when I see it. It's a feeling of being overwhelmed. And to then hear the speaker read those words out, uh, I, I, I have very bad thoughts. <laughs> there is guaranteed for visual learners, and we all learn visually, to some degree or other, but all the same. And I went down this path, I started a year and a half ago, because I'm still having difficulty understanding stuff and then expressing it to, to students, to undergraduates. And I found that images helped me. And then when I was speaking to a doctor friend, he said, oh, you're a visual learner then. And I thought, right, it's taken me 52 bloody years to find out I'm a visual learner. I wish I'd known that before, because things could have been very different. Who knows? So we do, we all know it to some degree or other, but there's few people, apart from blind people, that we can't communicate a message using this, uh, this approach. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and if you have any questions, please just shh, uh, shh. I think it's a shoot, shout. <laughs>